on this edition of Exposé, living side by side with industry. Everything revolves around the energy, the oil business. All my life I've heard that chemical plants are the, the smell of money. Never really knowing what is in the air. Should I believe when I call them that their test results are clean? Maybe not. Funding for Exposé has been provided by July 21, 2003. Black smoke from a Valero oil refinery darkens the skies over Houston, Texas. Airspace already ranked among the most polluted in the country. As is often the case, plant officials are silent about what is in the smoke. Only the next day, after the air has cleared and as required by law, does the company reveal what has been released an estimated 16,000 pounds of a noxious gas called propylene. It is the ninth unplanned release from the same facility in seven months. The Houston region, home to five and a half million people, has grown explosively in recent decades with an economy based in large part on energy and petrochemicals. Air quality has long been a point of concern and contention for residents. Historically, many here have accepted the environmental price they had to pay in order to reap the benefits of the industries that built this city and still drive its economy. When you grow up here and you drive around Houston, what you see are the petrochemical plants. All my life I've heard that chemical plants are the, the smell of money. Everything revolves around the energy and the oil business. In the spring of 2002, Jeff Cohen, newly hired as editor of the Houston Chronicle, returned to his hometown determined that the balance between industry and environment would be a key component of his paper's coverage. When I came back to Houston, I developed a list of what would be our master narratives, the stories that we were going to tell better than any other media outlet in the area. One of those was quality of life issues. And chief among quality of life issues is the story of, of clean air in Houston. Cohen had previously been editor of the Times Union in Albany, New York. There, the paper's environmental writer had been Dina Cappiello, a former high school science teacher, then fresh out of journalism school. When I became the editor in Houston, one of my early phone calls was to Dina to say, hey, how about uh, coming down here? I was applying to other places and seeing where I might go next. I really was looking for a place that had a lot of different issues. Dina is a quintessential environmental reporter. She is methodical about taking samples, about getting samples tested, and she's the only reporter I know who is beaming about having bottles of sludge on her desk. I asked the person who was going to take her around to do me a favor. Don't take her to the nice parts of Houston. Take her down 225. Make sure you go at night when the petrochemical plants are firing. And trust me on this one, she'll take the job before you get back to the newspaper. I mean, I'm from New Jersey, you know, I mean, you know, Northern Turnpike, all the jokes, you know, I know those kind of issues and I've seen it in my own eyes there and growing up with it. But as a reporter, it's just all I could step thinking was, well, first of all, wow. And then the second thought was, how am I going to crack this? How am I going to approach this? Back in the World War II era, the petrochemical industry was way out in the country, and you think we were maybe the 50th largest city of the United States, so we were not the fourth largest city like we are now. And what had been fairly remote 
refining and petrochemical plants, uh, really the neighborhoods tended to grow towards them. Houston's lack of post-war urban planning makes it distinct among America's big cities when it comes to zoning. Well, there's nothing to tell about zoning because we have no zoning, and that's one of the problems that neighborhoods like this face is that you have industry just right across the street from a house. So here's Manchester Street. This is the entrance to Manchester. As she began covering the environment beat for the Chronicle, Capiello found herself drawn to so-called fence line communities, like Manchester in southeast Houston. Here, often nothing more than wood or chain link fences stand between residents and the industrial plants that routinely release toxic substances. Whatever they have in those tanks right there is about a thousand yards from me. The Manchester area in Houston is essentially surrounded by many, many sources of air toxics. The ship channel runs right to the north of it, and uh, there are uh, high traffic uh, arteries, and then many, many different industrial sources. Industry officials insisted the plants posed no serious health risks to communities like Manchester. But Capiello was skeptical. She knew that area plants were legally permitted to emit significant amounts of known human carcinogens, such as benzene. You go to a gasoline station, you see that sign, these fumes are hazardous to breathe, blah, 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 blah. That's benzene. How, she wondered, could industry assure fence line residents that breathing air with so much of a known cancer causer was not hazardous to their health? They have data that shows what goes into the air. That's a gross amount, right? It's a total pounds. It's not the concentration. So when you're talking about what people breathe, you want the concentration. And what the concentration basically is, is there's X, amount of a chemical in X amount of air. The problem was no one had ever tested the air that people on the fence line breathe, right where they breathe it. The only data the state consistently gathered was in samplings from monitors like this. Monitors in some cases miles from the homes, parks, churches, and daycare centers where people in fence line communities like Manchester live and breathe. Capiello's instincts told her the air along the fence lines might not be healthy, but she wanted to hear firsthand from local residents about what they had experienced. Houston City Councilwoman Carol Alvarado, who grew up in Manchester and now represents the neighborhood, had plenty of experience. Kids from here were often teased about, if you came from Manchester, the smell. They'd say, oh, it smells like, you know, rotten eggs or something burning. Growing up here, I think, helped to shape my politics. I felt that there was always a balance that you could have business and you could have a clean environment. Capiello heard the same stories over and over from Alvarado and her constituents. My garden died. It's stuff on my house all the time. I get stuff on my cars all the time. A lot of times it smelled sweet. Sometimes it was like, ugh. And it is a stench that will turn your stomach and make you want to throw up. As a good reporter, I would call the company up and they'd be like, we're out there monitoring, everything's fine. The offensive smells were only part of the problem. Capiello learned that the July 2003 black smoke incident involving the Valero plant was only one dramatic example of something that happens on a regular basis in and around the city. Upset emissions, as they are known, happen more than 500 times a year. Upset emissions are kind of like these burps from facilities that happen during emergencies or they didn't mix it quite right and they have to kind of get rid of it. So if there was this event in Houston where it was black smoke. You know, you could see it. I mean, the t you know, TV helicopters were there, people I was interviewing were describing it. And I called the company and they said, oh, no, 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 no there's a thing in the air. Black smoke is a sign of incomplete combustion. It means that not all of the stuff is burning, which means that there is something going into the air. So if they're gonna tell me that, should I believe when I call them that their test results are clean? Maybe not. The stories Capiello heard around Houston had intrigued her. The denial from a plant official only inspired her to learn more.
in a city not zoned to keep people and plants apart. The next door neighbors of industry, she believed, deserved to know what was coming over the fence. I couldn't answer for people what was in the air, you know, which is obviously this essential question as a reporter. I mean, what people want to know is, yeah, it looks really bad, but what is it? And unlike ozone, which affects all of Los Angeles, right, or all of New York City because it's a very broad kind of pollutant, hazardous air pollutants are very local. So you're talking about an issue that affected the much smaller populace that, to be very frank, didn't have much political power and political access. Around this area, it's not a high income area. People really don't have the resources to really do something. But I can tell you this, that if they start putting up condos around here and getting these big lawyers and doctors to move in here, it would be a different story. Clean air is a moral and ethical issue. Houston Mayor Bill White had come to office promoting the idea that clean air is good for business. He was once an energy industry executive himself, but now White's aggressive stand on air pollution ruffled feathers in Houston's business community. I think it's critically important that we have a strong domestic refining and petrochemical industry for our American economy. I believe that in my bones, but nobody has the right to chemically alter the air somebody else is breathing, air that they do not own. But, White found, City Hall had little more control over toxics in the air than zoning on the ground. Because the state of Texas, not the city of Houston, regulates air pollution. Specifically, the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, the TCEQ. State monitoring stations like this one, as Capiello learned, keep tabs on ozone and measure dozens of air toxics like benzene and 1,3-butadiene. Results gathered from the monitors are compared with levels of air toxics permitted by Texas state guidelines. Guidelines which the reporter learned permit higher concentrations of some pollutants than are allowed anywhere else in the U.S. Beyond that, there are the monitoring procedures. Most of the sites collect data only once every six days. They take a 24-hour grab, things could be missed. And the locations of them could only provide us estimates. Capiella was convinced there was a story she needed to tell about air quality in fence line communities. And if she couldn't get the information she wanted from either industry or the state, she would just have to get the information herself. What Dina did was she came in with a project that said, you know, everyone is talking about Houston's air quality. No one has really gone out and objectively monitored it. Let's be the newspaper that, that does that. I love science. I think it's fascinating. I have a bachelor's degree in biology, I've got a master's in journalism, a master's in environmental science. I just am addicted to it. Journalism really is the scientific method. I mean, that's how I approach it, like I approach a scientific investigation. The hunch is, the air probably isn't great. <laughs> That's the hunch, you know, and, and you know, in science we'd call that hypothesis. And you say, something's not smelling right here. And then what do you do? You figure out how to test that. Capiello did have a science background, but she didn't have the expertise to conduct a widespread investigation of Houston's air on her own. So she went for guidance to the University of Texas School of Public Health, where Dr. Tom Stock has been studying human exposure to air pollution. Ina knew we had this pool called a passive sampler for air toxics. She uh, asked me one day, well, uh, couldn't say the newspaper to <laughs> use this kind of thing. The idea of uh, a newspaper doing this kind of study did seem to strike me as a bit novel and so uh, probably caused me a little bit of hesitation in the beginning, but her reasons were quite compelling to me. And I thought about it for a few seconds and I said, well, why not? Stock helped Capiello design a study the paper could carry out using equipment from the university's lab. This is the monitor that we use for the study. It comes packaged like this little pudding can where we have to open the tab and pull the top off, okay? I think that with any big project, it's you always have some doubts. I mean, I don't care what the topic is. And that's what the pollutants get absorbed onto that charcoal pad. 
And what we do then is just put it in a large vial and then add a desorption solvent to all the uh, contaminants that were measured should be in that liquid. That then gets added to a smaller vial and gets put into this tray here. I mean, you have a hypothesis, and in this case, we invested in that hypothesis. Passes through there, the compounds get separated, and then into the mass spectrometer, where you get an identification and quantification of the compounds. The Chronicle investigation would sample air over a 72-hour period. To carry out the plan, Cappiello recruited more than 80 volunteers to place the monitors and return them when the testing period was done. When I was doing the series, I would literally park my car and walk down the blocks and knock door to door. And if people weren't home, I actually came around with a letter in English and Spanish, asked them to volunteer. We received a letter and I told my husband, I said, wow, somebody's interested and should we call them or what should we do? And we thought about it for a couple days and he's like, well, you know, we got the kids here, we need to know. Terry Nunez and her husband Rick were on board. Their home sits in the shadow of a plant owned by Texas Petrochemicals. When you stop and think about it, it's look, we have a lot of money tied up in our investment in our home and everything, and we want to leave something for our children. And you know, then it gets you to start thinking, well, is this what I really want to leave my children, you know? And Councilwoman Carol Alvarado helped Capiello make further inroads into the community. I recruited people that voiced concerns about industry being so close to us. Parents participated and uh, some other extended family and neighbors. That it, for the most part, everybody was willing to participate. They felt it was important enough to do so. It shows that we do care and um, that we want to be a part of the solution. Nobody here, I think, wants to just point fingers and say, go away industry, or, or just to accept it. In July and August 2004, volunteers in four Houston communities placed 84 monitors on their homes and around their neighborhoods. Capiello placed another 16 in public spaces. The devices were the same many plants used to monitor the air their employees breathe in the workplace, a fact Capiello and her team hoped would help bulletproof the paper's report should industry attack it. We basically want to put it in an area that was kind of mouth level to kind of understand what the pollution was there instead of, you know, 100 feet up where nobody's breathing. It was the first time an investigation of this kind had ever been conducted in Houston. Dr. Tom Stock's lab analyzed the samples and the Chronicle had them evaluated by a team of consulting scientists. Six months after she started, Capiello's series, In Harm's Way, began appearing in the Houston Chronicle. January 16, 2005. The paper reported that the data revealed high levels of toxic chemicals in the air many Houstonians breathe daily. In Manchester, the median concentration of benzene was 1.67 micrograms per cubic meter, more than six times a federal risk level for possible negative health effects. In nearby Allendale, the median concentration of 1,3-butadiene was 9.16 micrograms per cubic meter, more than 14 times the federal risk level for that substance. And in her report, Capiello offered real-world comparisons to make the data hit home in fence line communities. It would be the equivalent of living on the New Jersey Turnpike. It would be the equivalent of having your house surrounded by cars at all times. That analogy was made by a scientist that I submitted our data to for review. These were the worst houses in terms of the level of the readings of all 100 locations that we put monitors at. Capiello reported that if this home were a hazardous waste dump, the levels of 1,3-butadiene found here would have triggered a federal investigation. For the first time, Houston's fence line residents knew exactly what they were breathing. The report did not paint a pretty picture of Houston air, but as Capiello informed her readers, in most cases, the level of air toxics measured by the Chronicle did fall within the guidelines the state of Texas considered acceptable. But her report examined those state guidelines too and found they were among the most lax in the nation. 
As an example, the New Jersey native pointed out the amount of suspected carcinogen 1,3-butadiene acceptable under Texas guidelines is 300 times higher than what would be considered safe in her home state. And a close look into the origins of current Texas guidelines, Capiello reported, revealed that they, in many cases, lacked scientific backing or were based on outdated research. What In Harm's Way said is it's much worse than we thought because we we're only getting part of the picture. The data was out there, but the data was being compared to guidelines that were antiquated and, and weren't scientific and in, much, and in some cases were much higher than other states. So if you compare it to this, and it's always this, you're never going to see the problem because this is wrong. The level's wrong. Industry officials were quick to criticize the Chronicle report. A letter from the Valero Houston refinery reflected a common sentiment. It underscored the company's commitment to the health of the community, and it called the comparison of a 72-hour test to annual industry screening levels inappropriate. But Capiello remained confident she had crafted a report that would stand up to scrutiny. Not only had the Chronicle used equipment that many plants themselves used to monitor their workplace air, the paper had also produced data that were not markedly different from concentration levels the state had been finding for years with its regional monitors. There's a very telling graphic in the series where we show the range the state had detected the year prior to our results. And our dot always falls into the state's range, which basically says the state knew about it. Capiello presented each volunteer with a personalized copy of the results. I've lived around these chemical plants all my life. I understand the risk of living here, but what I read in the report, it shouldn't be that high risk. They're making money out there. They're making more money than they've ever made in their life, and they still want to put their crap out on me and my family and my neighbors. What Dina was saying, I've been saying all along, she came in and gave it a lot of credibility. I was very pleased, uh, relieved, a sense of, wow, this is long overdue. Three months after the publication of In Harm's Way, Mayor Bill White convened a task force on air toxics in Houston, and the city began putting pressure on plants to reduce dangerous emissions. Twelve months after the report came out, Texas Petrochemicals, whose legally permitted emissions of 1,3-butadiene were among the highest in the nation, signed a voluntary agreement with the state to reduce its emissions of the suspected carcinogen. That one facility has reduced their concentrations by 50% that are going over the fence, which is a huge, huge reduction in one year. We'd already initiated some things, but her article really helped sharpen the awareness and focus of a number of people in the community. And I saw that it was going to be much harder for the lawyers and lobbyists, for the polluters who had uh, resisted regulation for years and years and years to delay what needed to be done. I have a background in this industry, and I know that we can improve in this industry. We're going to celebrate and highlight those firms take a step in the right direction, and the people that just dig in their heels and fight, well, they're going to be in for a fight. This white box right here, that is actually a TCEQ air pollution monitor, and they put this in after the series came out. So that's the brand new monitor, and as you can see, it's kind of right in the middle of the neighborhood. Chemical companies aren't going to leave. People aren't going to leave, but there needs to be a dialogue. The people that lived in these fence line neighborhoods, they were asking very clearly, what is in my air? But nobody was giving them a clear answer. So we basically had to do it by ourselves. And that's what we did. I'm still writing about it. God, it's been two years and it's still having an effect. And that's, that's pretty amazing to me. I don't think I would have predicted that. Common people are always the ones that just get neglected, you know, and, and uh, she really gave, us, gave the people a voice, and you know, I'm thankful for that, I'm very thankful for that.
funding for expose has been provided by